Previously we did a circuit shown here of a halfway rectifier and then we displayed it on an analog discovery, an 82, to check on the performance of this simple half-wave rectifier. And what we discovered was we had to add a capacitor for some charge storage. And the size of the capacitor is somewhat important. Depending on the load, of course, the capacitor has to hold enough charge to bridge between the positive pulses. And in a half-wave rectifier, those positive pulses occur every 60th of a second. And in between, there is no uh, charge coming through the diode. And so the capacitor has to bridge, as we saw in the previous. So I had said in that one that if there was enough interest uh, that we might continue this. And what we're doing is working from this book, Learning the Art of Electronics, hands-on lab course by, uh, I think it's uh, Thomas Hayes. And so there certainly was, seems to be a fair amount of interest in continuing. And I want to thank everyone for their positive comments and suggestions. And by the way, suggestions are always appreciated for where we go from here. One person suggested that we might want to do some advanced topics. We're definitely going to get to those. But for the time being, I think we're going to stick to the, to the uh, more uh, fundamental or basic uh, experiments. So uh, where we're going to go next is to actually implement the circuit that's shown in the book, and that's this one. That is using a full wave bridge rectifier. In this particular case, I'm using a DL005, but these are available in all sorts of different configurations. So we're going to use the same transformer. We're going to hook up a bridge rectifier and a 1.5K load resistor here. And then we're going to look at this with the analog discovery and see if that makes things any better. Just as before, we're using the analog discovery 2 with the BNC adapter board. Now, in a minute, we're going to remove this board and uh, use the fly wires, but we'll talk about that when we get there. And over on the breadboard is the circuit. And here is the little bridge rectifier that we were talking about. We have the transformer connected to the, uh, the line. And by the way, I didn't emphasize that, but on these bridge rectifiers, the place that you connect the line voltage, that is the AC, is normally shown by these sideways S symbols. Uh, they're a depiction of a side sine wave. And so that's where the line goes. And then there is usually one pin labeled plus and one pin labeled minus. The minus is where the negative output is and the plus is where the positive output is. So we have a resistor between those two. And now we're going to put the analog discovery across this resistor, fire it up and see what we get. Well, this is the scope of the analog discovery. And as you'll notice, it's untriggered. So I thought I might show you a few things. One is, I always click on this down arrow over here to expand this second line because it's got some neat things, including what's called auto set right here. We're not going to use that just yet, but we may use it in the future. Right now, we have to change the trigger to channel 2. And you'll notice that it... Uh, begins to synchronize. We're going to go over here now and grab the trigger level and slide it up to about the midpoint there. Now we're going to go over to channel 2 and we're going to set the attenuation to 10x, which is the probe we have there. We're going to do the same thing for uh, channel 1. We're not using channel 1 just yet. And we're going to go to 5 volts per division on each of the channels. Okay. Now, as you see over here on the left, this is 20 volts. 
So we're getting about uh, just a little over 20 volts at the peak. Now let's change the time base to 5 milliseconds per division. And here you get the output from a bridge. Now let me point out the major difference. Earlier, with the half-wave rectifier, we were getting a pulse, and then there would be a blank space, and then another pulse. What the bridge has done is filled in that blank space with an inverted version of the other half cycle. So in other words, we still get the positive half cycle, but what would have been the negative half cycle, because of the way the bridge works, is turned into a positive pulse that fills in the gap, and then another positive half cycle, and so on. Now what I would like to do is to show you on channel 1 the AC signal, but I can't do that. Not the way I have it presently configured. And the reason is because of the way that the BNC board and, frankly, most oscilloscopes work. If I were to try to put channel 1 across the AC line, I would wind up shorting out one of the diodes in the bridge. The reason is that channel 1 and channel 2 share a common ground. So the ground of channel 1 and the ground of channel 2 have to be the same point. And that is true of the BNC board, that is true of most oscilloscopes except some very expensive differential scopes. However, I have some good news. The analog discovery, if you don't use the BNC board, has differential inputs. So, I'm going to switch from the BNC board and the 10X probes to the fly wires so that I can show you the synchronization between the AC line and the output of the bridge rectifier. I'll show you the fly wires in a second, but I first thought I'd show you what we have on the scope. Now the yellow trace is channel 1, which is the AC line. And once again, it's going from uh, a, a negative 22 or 23 volts to a positive peak of 22 or 23 volts and back again at 60 cycles per second. Our bridge rectifier is rectifying the positive pulse but it's turning the negative pulse into a positive pulse as well, or the negative half cycle into a positive pulse. So, what that means is that instead of the capacitor having to fill in between this point and over here, that is like this, now it only has to cover the time from here to there. So we don't need quite as big a capacitor. Or, to put it another way, a bridge circuit has less ripple for the same size capacitor as a half-wave rectifier, which is one of the advantages of a bridge. So let's take a look now at the circuit and then we'll add a capacitor. Here is the circuit on the breadboard. You'll notice that the two orange wires, which are the channel 1 inputs, are connected right across the AC line coming from, or actually the 12 volt uh, output of this transformer, but the AC coming from the transformer, which goes into these two pins of this bridge. And then the positive comes here, and the negative goes over there, and that's connected to the blue wires, which is channel 2. This is one of the advantages, as long as you stay within its limitations of the Analog Discovery 2, because it has true differential inputs now, why couldn't you do this with the uh, BNC board? The reason is that one of these wires, which is the wire that's the ground for channel 1, on the BNC board is tied to the ground in channel 2. But in the circuit, those two points are not at the same potential. If you were to hook the ground of channel 2 here and the ground of channel 1 here, you would, in essence, be shorting out one of the diodes in this bridge, and the circuit would not be working correctly. It's also possible, under circumstances like this, for you to cause uh, a shock hazard or to create uh, 
a risk to the equipment you're using. So if you're not aware of this and you're using a standard oscilloscope, that is one that does not have differential inputs like the AD2, or you're using the AD2 with the BNC board, be aware, the inputs are not differential. The two grounds are the same point in the circuit. So if you hook a ground somewhere for, for one channel, you have to hook all the channel grounds to that same, uh, to that same voltage. Okay, uh, enough about this. Now let's add a capacitor to this and see what it does to the performance. I've added the 47 microfarad capacitor here. So let's look at what that did to the DC output. As we see, it has filled it in. And because we're using a full wave rectifier, a bridge in this case, it only has to fill in half as far as it would have to do with a full wave. In other words, if, I'm sorry, with a half wave. If this were a half wave, this capacitor would continue to discharge here until it reached this point over here. But this pulse comes along from that full wave bridge and recharges the capacitor. So instead of every 60th of a second, the uh, circuit gets recharged twice every 60th of a second. That's one of the advantages of full wave rectifier. Okay, that's all interesting, but one of the purposes of this series is to teach you a little bit about the analog discovery. And I thought this might be an appropriate point to add measurements to the uh, to your repertoire of uh, things you know about the analog discovery. So let me show you how you do that. The first thing you need to do, and I'm going to zoom in a little so that you can see this a little better, is you need to go to this area up here in the upper left-hand corner where it says File Control View Window. And you have to click on View. And this drop-down list appears. Then you click on Measurement. Now let me move the camera over here and you see that a new panel has appeared over here on the left called measurements. And now we are going to add a measurement. Now you can do uh, a number of these but we're going to stick to the simpler ones right now. We're going to use a defined measurement. And we're going to do that on channel 2 and we want to do a vertical and what we want to measure is the DC RMS or the AC RMS. What we're going to do is we're going to click on that one and add it. And we're also going to add the DC RMS and add that. And now you see we have two measurements. The AC RMS is 537 millivolts. Let me expand this window out a little bit and make it easier to read. There we are. That is the AC RMS. In other words, that's the ripple. The DC RMS is, is the total RMS. In other words, it is the value measured from zero volts. Let me explain. From zero volts up to this point is about 19 volts. And then the 
signal goes above that to about uh, 20 point, oh, I'm guessing maybe 20.6 or something like that. In other words, it goes 966 above 19, and what is giving you is the average of this blue trace. In other words, the average DC value. This is what you can count on being able to deliver to a load. Now, when I say count on, anytime you load a power supply, you get some sag. And so this signal will likely sag a little bit when we load this supply down. But at any rate, it gives you an idea that on average you can get about 19.96 volts out of this supply, at least with no load. While the ripple, that is how much this varies from the bottom to the top, is 537 millivolts. Well, you can calculate the percentage ripple by dividing the ripple value, that is the AC RMS, by the DC RMS. And that's one of the calculations that these measurements facilitate. Now, it turns out you can actually do that calculation inside the software of the Analog Discovery. I won't show it now because I'm saving that for a future, uh, future project. But for right now, on a calculator, if you divide the DC RMS into the AC RMS, you get the ripple percentage for this power supply. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned that a half wave supply isn't as good as a full wave. We've learned that you need a certain size capacitor in order to fill in the gaps between the pulses. We've discovered that the analog discovery has differential inputs as long as you use the flywires. And finally, we've discovered how to use measurements on the scope traces. I hope that's enough for now, but in the meantime, I would like to elicit suggestions from anyone that uh, might have an opinion on where we should go from here. I do read comments. I try to respond to questions, and I can't do, of course, everything that everyone might want, but I certainly can at least consider it. So uh, post your suggestions. If you have the book, uh, or Learning the Art of Electronics, well, take a look in there. You might look in the table of contents or just thumb through the chapters. And if there are particular experiments that you'd like to see done using the analog discovery, now, remember, the analog discovery is restricted to about 30 megahertz. So a project that uh, is outside the 30 megahertz range is probably not appropriate for the analog discovery. But any of the projects within the 30 megahertz bandwidth are fair game, and I'll certainly consider them. In the meantime, I hope you'll look forward to some more videos, and have a nice day.